Welcome to Board Gems. In this video, I'll be showing you how to play the new version of Leonardo da Vinci, designed by the Italian design group Akitoka in 2006. The new version is called Codex Lester, published by Dice Tree and co designed by Dice Tree's founder, Chang Yun Beck. To set up the game, place the board on the table between the players. The board is double sided. This is the invention row, and in the one to three player game, there's a pair of three spaces each, and in the four or five player game, there's four of each. This is the invention row. These are the present inventions. These are the future inventions. I'm going to set it up for a three player game. Shuffle up these red banners. These are called, they're patron benefits. I don't know what they're called, <laughs> but they're patron benefits. You're going to mix these up and put five here on the side of the board. The rule book actually suggests a particular five for your first game. These are the council tiles. You're going to shuffle these up and you're going to fill up these spaces here. Um, check the number that you deal out based on number of players. I'm setting it up for a three player game, so I'm gonna fill up all four of these. Nearby, you're going to have the materials, the resources, stone, wood, glass, brick, and rope. These are special things that can come into play based on particular cards. So just put those here for now. And this is for work resolve tokens. I usually just like to keep them in the little convenient plastic bin. There's two black markers. One will go up here as a round marker. You'll see there are seven rounds. And the other one will go here to mark the cost of performing an action, the current cost. So this will slide between zero and four. We just put it on the zero there. The rules change very slightly in rounds four and six. So you're going to put the matching tokens on these spaces. And when that round comes up, you're going to move them onto the board. The cards with Leonardo da Vinci on the back are epic inventions. Shuffle these up and deal out a certain number based on the number of players. In a three player game, that will be six. If we look at the anatomy of an invention, this number in the top left is how much time, how many work units or work weeks is necessary to build this invention. This is the benefit in coins. Coins are victory points in this game for the player who first completes the invention and anyone else who has started the invention before it was finished. If they finish that invention later, they will get the smaller number instead of the bigger number. This symbol is mostly used for end game scoring. You'll get points slash money for having many different symbols as well as multiples of the same symbol. And there can be potentially a benefit to future inventions built of that type. This is the benefit that you get the player who initially completes the invention. The one who completes the invention first gets this card and will get this benefit. These with a 15 work week requirement are epic inventions and their benefits are all for the end of the game. At the end of the game, you will get two coins per symbol, for example. And this is the cost in resources to build that invention. These are the regular inventions. You're going to shuffle up these cards and you're going to fill up the invention row, starting with the present row and then the future. These inventions have a work week cost of four, seven, or 11. There can be no more than one 11 in the present row. This was completely wrong. I don't know what I was thinking of here. There can be no 11 cost inventions in the present row. So in this case, I'll just set this aside for now and keep drawing. And this is the future row. You are going to deal out cards here, but at least two must be smaller than 11. This one, which we set aside, can just get shuffled back into the deck and placed on this space. These are workshop extensions. You're gonna add one of each type per player. So for this three player game I'm setting up, I will add three of each type. Each player can get one of each type. And the rest you don't need can 
go into the box. Give each player all the pieces of a particular color, the matching shield, behind which you're going to keep your resources and money. On the inside it shows the setup steps, how the seven rounds play out, and end game scoring. Each player is going to get three boards. They get a personal player board, as well as two workshops. This is the hammer workshop, this is the pincer workshop. Each player has two hammers, which will go on this space here, and two pincers, which will go on this space. The third space is for a black one. On the player board, you're going to add your master in this round space, three apprentices in this space. It shows three apprentices and a coin with an X through it. That's because at different points during the game, you will have to pay salary to your apprentices. But three, these three, are free. Any additional apprentices, you will have to pay the salary. And additional apprentices you gain will go here. One apprentice is locked for now, and it can be unlocked later. The remaining apprentices will go here in the academy. These are automata. They're double-sided. The ones on the tank treads are super powerful. Don't worry about that for now. Just have their standing up side, which is their, their weaker side face up. One is going to be locked on your player board there. The other two get placed here. And you'll see each player will do the same. This banner shaped token will go up here at the top of the knowledge track. And you're going to place one cube in each of these spaces. These are patron requests. When you complete a patron request, you will advance on the knowledge track and unlock this cube to be placed to gain one of these benefits here. Each player also gets one disc, which will be used to track turn order. Mix this up and draw randomly. And this is only going to be used during setup. This order will change during setup. Each player gets a number of coins behind their screen. In a three-player game, each player will get two coins, as well as possibly additional based on what the final turn order result is at the end of the setup phase. As the name suggests, these multi-purpose cards serve a few different purposes. For one thing, they have a symbol on the top, which are the same as symbols found on the inventions. The first player to complete an invention will get that invention card and that symbol. The second player to complete that same invention wouldn't get the card because there's only one invention card, but they would take one of these with the matching symbol and put it in front of them so they have the symbol also. On the bottom is something for the solo mode, but for setup what we care about are these middle icons inside the book. These are potential benefits that you can start the game with. Each player is going to be dealt four and then later on, they will choose two of those four to start with. It, it can be some combination of money, uh, materials for starting inventions, uh, workshop extensions, uh, automata. Uh, this is an automaton or an apprentice. The slash means or. And then we determine the turn order for the first round. The player who is going first during the setup phase looks at their cards, looks at the inventions, and chooses one position to be in for the first round. If they choose position one, then they are going first. Position two, they'll gain an extra coin. Position three, two extra coins. This is shown here on the screen. For four and five players, it's a little bit different. For simplicity, let's just say everybody chose, well, let's choose this. How about this? And now that the player order is determined and potentially more coins are given out, Purple is going last, so they're actually going to get two additional coins. Now the players take their four cards that they were dealt and choose two of them to gain their starting benefit. Every player chooses their card secretly and then in this order reveals, takes the resources, so everybody sees what resources they take, but resources and money go behind the screen. But there are also other benefits that can be gained. So if Purple, for example, chose these two cards, they would gain an additional three coins, one wood and glass. And this particular workshop extension, 
There's three workshop extensions and they go into your workshops. Your hammer workshop already has three spaces, but can gain an additional two. In these spaces, masters and apprentices can go to perform work on particular inventions. These red spaces, which have furnaces, can also, instead of taking a master or an apprentice, can also take an automaton, if you have one. You'll see you don't have any rooms in your pincer workshop to start. These are extensions that you can add to your pincer workshop, so you have two workshops that can perform work on different inventions. After setup, these cards can just go back into the deck, and that's set up. You're ready to begin. The goal of the game is to get money. The player with the most money at the end of the game wins. The main way of gaining money in this game is by completing inventions. At the start of each round, you can choose which inventions your workshops will be working on. Completing an invention will give you the number of florins at the top, the larger numbers for the player who first completes the invention. And there are some other benefits that can be gained as well. The first thing that happens every round is players choose what their workshops are going to be working on, starting in reverse turn order. So in this case, purple would go first. Purple has just one workshop that can do work. That's this hammer workshop. In order to start an invention, you need the appropriate resources. You can start any invention that is visible. The present inventions, the future inventions, or the even the epic inventions. However, you cannot complete future inventions yet. But over the course of the game, as inventions in the present row are completed and removed, these cards will slide down. In order to start an invention, you take the resources printed at the bottom of the invention and place them from behind your screen into the basement of your workshop. You place one of your hammers on the card to signal to the other players that you are working on this invention at your hammer workshop. The other players can also start working on that invention. We look at the number of work units or work weeks that is required to complete this invention. In this case, it's four. The player will take their, in this case, black hammer and place it on the four space. As they perform work on their invention, they will move their remaining hammer marker along this track. And when the hammer moves forward, such that it reaches or passes the black hammer, they have immediately completed the invention. The first player who completes an invention gets the largest number in coins and gets this card, which will give them this symbol as well as potentially an extra benefit. Now, when a player takes a card, if there are other players working on this invention, they can still continue to work on it. If they complete the invention, they will get this smaller number in Florence. If they're the second player to complete the invention, except in a two-player game, I think, they will also get a matching symbol from the multi-purpose deck. It is possible for this marker to be moved downward, but you only complete an invention on your action when you move your hammer icon forward to reach or pass the black hammer. If it looks like this, and some benefit on a card, say, allows you to move this like so, you have not completed the invention. It can only be completed when you are progressing your hammer. On a later round, if you've already started an invention but you want to change gears, you can give up on an invention. You get your resources back, and you reset this before deciding what else to work on. But any work that you've already completed on this invention is lost. So in reverse turn order, each player is going to be declaring which inventions their workshop is going to be working on. After all players have done that, then we play the round proper, which will go in forward turn order. So in this case, starting with green and ending with purple. There are multiple locations that your workers, your master and your apprentices can be placed. There's the spaces on the central board, A through H, there's also an I in the four or five player game, which is a way of getting a little bit extra money. You can also place your workers in your workshop, and that's how work is performed toward an invention. Currently, at the start of the game, you have one master and three apprentices. You can get more apprentices, and you can get automata that will help you perform work. 
On your turn, you pick one location to place workers in, A through H or A through I, or one of your two workshops. When you choose a location, you choose to either place your one master or one or more of your apprentices, never both on the same turn. If you place it in one of the central areas, you'll take your one or more pieces and you'll place it on the row underneath the letter and shows the benefit of that location. And place them on the far left end. Later players, when they place their master or apprentices, would go to the right of that. Once you place apprentices in a location, you cannot place any more apprentices in that location for the rest of this round. So if you decide you want to put apprentices in space A, the council, you choose right now how many apprentices to put in. If you put in two, okay, but later on you can't place any more apprentices. Now on a later turn, you could still place your master. You can place your master where there are your apprentices, and you can place your apprentices where there is your master. Your master is worth two apprentices. What do you mean worth? Well, when these spaces are resolved at the end of the round, the player who has the most influence will be able to do the action earlier and cheaper. Each apprentice gives you one influence, the master gives you two. Apprentices and the master can also be placed in one of your workshops, and this performs work immediately. So let's say earlier in the round the player chose to work on this invention. The player could choose to place one or more apprentices in their workshop into the spaces, and for each strength of apprentice you would perform that much work. So these are two apprentices, so that would gain two work. Now you cannot place any more apprentices in the workshop this round. It works exactly the same way as these. The first time you put apprentices in a location, you must choose how many to put in, and you can never add more later, but you can still later add your master. You place the master, and it immediately does two work. Voila, we've completed this invention. So players will be taking turns placing all their available apprentices and their master. Let's show you how it works in practice. Let's say in this first round nobody decides to work on their invention, everybody's putting their apprentices and master. Let's see how that looks in practice. Let's say at the end of the round it looked like this. All three players have placed their three apprentices and their master. Because players may have different numbers of apprentices, over the course of the game, and they can choose how many to put down on their turn, players may run out of pieces faster than other players. You keep going around until all masters and apprentices are placed. Any apprentices and masters placed in their workshops immediately perform work. Any that are placed on the central board are evaluated now at the end of the round. And we start with A and we go through H, or I. For each location, you evaluate how much influence each player has. In the case of a tie, you look at whose piece was placed earlier. If it looked like this, purple would go first with two influence, yellow would go second, two influence but later, placed later, and green going last. They place their piece first but they have less influence than the other two players. And in this case, yellow will go first, then purple, then green. Starting with A, the council. First, players use this to choose their turn order for the next round. Starting with the player with the most influence, that player chooses their position in turn order for the next round. Let's say green wants to go last in the second round. Then it would be yellow's turn to choose. Maybe yellow goes first. Anybody that is left will just keep their existing order relative to each other. So if green was the only player in the council, and did this, the other two pieces would be placed like that. Not every player in the council, but up to a certain number of places. In a three-player game, that would be two places. The two players with the most influence in the council get to choose a council tile. Benefits either are immediate or last for one round. Players take them, put it in front of them. Any council tiles that are left will gain one coin at the end of the round. Going to B, each of these locations, B through H, can have its action performed four times total, maximum. 
and this is the cost. The first time the action is performed, it's free, then two florins, then three, then four. So going in the order of the most influence, in this case yellow, yellow for free can choose one of these three things. Either gain a workshop extension, or gain an automaton, or perform one work for one coin. Automata can only be placed in furnace rooms. So if you don't have any furnace rooms yet, you can still claim an automaton, it just doesn't do anything yet. You just put it to the side. So in this case, yellow would choose first. Yellow, let's say yellow chooses, they want to, they want to open up their, their pincer workshop. So they take this one and they place it on their board. This one is for the hammer workshop. These two expand your pincer workshop. So yellow does that, it's free. Now it's purple's turn, but this marker moves one space. Purple can choose one of these three actions, but they must pay two florins. If they pass, they don't have to perform the action, but if they pass, they remove their workers, and then it's the next player who has the option to perform that action, in this case for two coins. So if purple passed, green could then perform an action for two coins. Let's say green already has room for, for automata, so he chooses to gain an automata and pays two coins. Then it goes to three, it's now back to yellow. Yellow can perform another action. If yellow performs an action, let's say they get an automaton too, then it's back to green. And green can perform one action for four coins. Let's say green chooses not to, green passes. It is back to yellow. And yellow can perform an action again, this time for four coins, but only four actions maximum. Once somebody performs an action for four coins, nobody else at that location gets any more benefit. Players will take all their workers back. In this location, players can either gain an apprentice or buy any material for one coin. And we would start with purple. Purple, maybe for free, would gain an apprentice. And new apprentices get placed in this large area here. Later on, in rounds three, five, and seven, they will have to pay one florin for every apprentice that's in that box. And then it'll be Green's turn, who can do one of those two actions for two coins, and so on. In this example, these five locations allow players to gain resources. Yellow, being the only player in D, would get one stone for free, then may buy a second stone for two coins, may buy a third stone for three coins, or may buy a fourth stone for four coins. After all the locations on the board are performed, A through H, or I, depending on the player count, that's the end of the round. Any remaining council tiles get one florin added to the space beneath them. But each space can only have two. Let's say it's later in the game and there's already two florins under this, and you would add a third, Instead, just remove it and remove the florins. If there's still some left in the draw pile, there are only eight, then you will refill. If there aren't any left, then you would reshuffle the used ones to form a new tiny deck <laughs> of actions. So you'll see the same actions come up again and again. And that's it. After players get all their workers back, then we're on to round two with this order. And again, starting with choosing what each of the, the player's two workshops will do. At the start of round three, each player must pay one florin for every apprentice beyond three, and again at round five and again at round seven. In round four, you see in the B space, you can get a workshop extension or an automaton or buy one work for one coin. Now this replaces it. Now for one action, you can spend two coins for two work. And again at round six, C and B get replaced. So in round six, instead of buying a resource for one florin, you instead can buy two work for three florin. And this one gets replaced. And in round seven, it's a little bit different. These locations, instead of offering you the opportunity to buy resources, now give you the opportunity to sell. And you use this lower row. The player with the most influence in D, for example, would get to sell one stone 
for two coins. Always the matching resource. So if you want to sell stone and wood, you're going to have to be in both locations. The first time it's sold, that first action, that player is going to be able to sell one for two coins. The second action that's performed, sell one resource for one. Third action, sell two for one. And as a fourth action, sell three of that kind for one coin. And again, you can only sell four times total amongst all the players. There's a few more additional little quirks. Some of the cards may allow you to gain a work resolve token. This is something that you can spend on your turn to gain one work at one of your workshops. This is the knowledge track, and these are patron requests. Every time you complete a patron request, you get to move your banner marker down one space and gain the benefit. The first time you perform any of these requests, you'd move the marker down one space and immediately gain one coin. The second time you complete a request, you gain either an apprentice or an automaton, one of the two that are locked on your player board. If you choose the apprentice, that would go here just like your other ones. The third patron request allows you to get two coins. The fourth unlocks the other one. So if you got the apprentice and when the banner was on this space, now you'll get the automaton, the other thing. One material of your choice, three coins. And when you perform a patron request, besides advancing on this track, you get to move the cube that's in that banner space on your player board onto one of these banners on the main board. And these all grant additional benefits sometimes just one time, sometimes continuously, marked by the lightning bolt or the infinity symbol. Let's go over the patron requests. This one, which shows the A, is related to the council. The first time you have the most influence in the council, you get to move this cube into the second space. The second time you're first in, in the council, you unlock that patron benefit, move on the knowledge track, and then place this cube on any of these spaces. This one, B, relates to where you get your workshops and automata if you're able to claim all three workshop extensions and both of your automata that are in this space, you unlock this cube and advance on the knowledge track. This one, you've claimed all your apprentices at the academy, the C location. This one, you've completed an invention, your first invention. Remember, when you complete inventions, you'll gain cards that show the symbol. And the first time you get two of the matching symbol, you will unlock this cube. And finally, this one is unlocked when you're able to complete an epic invention that takes 15 work. You can only gain each benefit once. So if purple goes here to get two materials of their choice, and later on they unlock another cube, they can't go back here. They would have to pick something else. But multiple players, can be in the same location, the same banner, that's fine. These benefits can change from game to game. The two that are available in every game, minus one work per matching symbol. Because when you complete an invention, if you're the first or second person to complete that invention, you will gain this symbol. And if you have a cube on this space, the amount of work required to complete that invention is decreased by one for every matching symbol you've already collected. The other benefit that's pre-printed on the board and available in every game is to upgrade your automata. How do automata work? Well, automata, when you gain them, can only be placed in furnace rooms. An automaton triggers the first time a player adds workers to their workshop. If a player already has an automaton in their workshop, then the first time they place a worker, let's say they place one apprentice in their workshop, they put it in any empty space. Immediately, any automata that are there start and they perform work. A regular automaton performs one work. So the first apprentice that goes in there would actually gain the user two work. One for the apprentice, one for the automaton. If later on the player adds their master to the workshop, they perform another two work, but the automaton doesn't activate again. It's only when it's the pawns first get added to the workshop. This space allows you to upgrade your automata to 
their other side on little tank treads. Now they are extra strong automata, and now whenever they activate, they perform two work instead of one. The right side of the player screen shows the end game scoring. You look at your symbols that you've collected on inventions you've completed or the multi-purpose cards that you have collected if you are the second player to complete an invention. You'll get symbols. And if you, at the end of the game, have two different symbols, you'll score three florins. Three different will give you six, four different will give you ten, and if you have all five different ones, you will score fifteen. If you have four of the same symbol, you will collect six, and if you have five of the same symbol, you'll get a bonus ten. This will give you bonus coins for every epic invention that you've completed. Epic inventions have particular bonuses that you will score at the end of the game. And this says that all materials at the end of the game are worth nothing. So you may want to sell your excess in the seventh and final round. The game looks a little intimidating, but it's fairly straightforward once you learn the rules. At any rate, if you have questions, feel free to ask in the comments, and I'll try to help you as best I can. That's pretty much it. I think you're ready to play Codex Lester. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like Leonardo da Vinci, of which this is an updated version of, don't stop being good just because newer games come out. But newer deluxe versions are, of course, quite nice and welcome. Take care.